First Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now the word humble here, or the thought expressed by the word that's translated humble, is talking about being submitted. You may notice uh, a verse just before we started with verse 6. In verse 5, it's talking about younger men submitting themselves unto the elders and all of the sub subject are submitted in to one another. So here where he's talking about in verse 6, humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. He's talking about submitting yourself unto God. Now how do we submit ourselves to God? Well, the most obvious way is that if we submit ourselves to God, we have to be submitted to his word because God and his word are one, Right? Well, here it says in verse 6 that if we'll humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he will exalt us in due time. So if we're submitting ourselves to the word, then that exalting or lifting up would have to be the word or the promises of the word coming to pass in our lives, could, wouldn't it? Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. He's talking about if we submit ourselves to the word, that which the word declares will become a reality in our lives. Humble yourselves therefore unto the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Let me read this to you from the Amplified. Verse 7 from the Amplified says this. It says, casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him, for he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Philip's translation says something to this effect. He says, cast the whole of your anxieties upon him because he personally cares for you. Now, folks, somewhere along the way, we're going to have to fess up and recognize that if we're worrying, it's because we don't trust God. Because if we're trusting God to do what his word says to do, and that presupposes that we're looking for and have found the promise of God to build our faith on or to stand on for whatever we're believing for, then if we're still anxious about it, if we're still carrying around worry or have any cares about us, about this subject or this part of our experience, then we're not really trusting God. We used to sing songs in the Baptist church, bring your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Well, we were good about bringing our burden to the Lord, but we were lousy about leaving it there. We'd bring it to the Lord and tell him how much we needed him to do something about it. And then we'd get up from that place of prayer and we had the same cares and concerns and worries that we had before we started. But the Bible says that the one way that we cast our, our one way that we humble ourselves unto the Lord is that we cast all of our care upon him. Now I want to read some things from the, uh, from the gospels, Matthew chapter six and Mark chapter 10. Turn with me to those two openings. Matthew chapter 6 and Mark chapter 10. I want to start with Matthew 6, verse 19. He says, lay, up, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where the thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, I want to skip over to uh, Matthew, or Mark chapter 10 real quickly and show you what Jesus said to somebody else about laying up treasures in heaven. Verse 17 of Mark 10. And when he was talking about Jesus, and when he had gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Well, he's got his heart in the right place, doesn't he? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Here's the answer to his question. He said, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor your father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, answered Jesus back and said, Master, all these things have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. Now, folks, if God tells you you're only missing one thing, you're doing pretty good. But he says, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatsoever you have, 
and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Now, that's exactly what he said in Mark chapter 6. Lay not up for yourselves treasure on the earth where man can get involved with and, and, um, uh, and it can be corrupted or stolen. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Jesus calls this treasures in heaven, the instruction that he gives to the rich young ruler to give to the poor, to give willingly, to divest himself of some of his possessions. Now, God's not trying, or Jesus here isn't trying to get him to, to turn loose of anything because he doesn't want him to have something. He certainly isn't telling him that he's done the wrong thing. The Bible says he, he, Jesus loved him before he did anything. Jesus loved him because his concern and his attention and his focus apparently for his life was on keeping the law of God. Now he wants to go further and wants to know about inheriting eternal life. There's a lot for Jesus to love about this guy. But he doesn't want him to be covetous. See, Jesus didn't quote all ten of the, uh, of the commandments. He left out, thou shalt not covet. He left out some of the instructions or some of the commandments that this guy, that's holding this guy, this rich young ruler back. So Jesus says, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatsoever you have and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. And talking about the rich young ruler, it says, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Somebody once said, and I think I can agree with this, the problem is that his possessions had him. Not that he had great possessions. Having great possessions, being rich, having plenty, that's not a problem with God. I know it's a problem with a lot of the church. But it's not a problem with God. But one thing that is a problem with God is when we're covetous and our possessions have a hold of us. And Jesus looked round about, verse 23, and said unto his disciples, How hardly they shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at the words. Now I want you to think this through with me. Jesus has just told the rich young ruler, sell what you have and give to the poor and come follow me. The one thing that you lack is treasure in heaven. How do you get treasure in heaven? By giving. Well, he has a problem with that. The rich young ruler has a problem with that because his possessions are too important they're playing too big a role in his life. So Jesus, after the rich young ruler leaves, Jesus says to the disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Well, if the disciples are poor and expect to be poor, like a lot of the church portrays them or tells us that we're supposed to be, why would they not pound their chest and say, yeah, that's right, they need to be more like us? But they're astonished. I want you to get that. I want to hammer this point home. They were astonished out of measure. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure. Why are they astonished out of measure on this time, at this point? Because Jesus says that it's hard, hard for the one that trusts in his riches to enter into the kingdom of God. They were astonished out of measure among them and said among themselves, who then can be saved? Folks, they know about Abraham's blessing. They know that the blessing of Abraham makes them rich. Keeping the commandments of God is what made the rich young ruler rich. It's what gave him his possessions to begin with. And these guys are astonished out of measure. And they conclude or show their surprise by saying, well, then who can be saved? They're expecting everybody that would be called a child of God or a follower of God to have access to the blessing of Abraham to be made rich. Can you see that? I know a lot of times people have problems with the word rich, and rich doesn't mean millionaire or billionaire or trillionaire or whatever attachment we want to put on that. Rich means you have more than enough. Rich simply means an abundant supply. Now, whatever you measure that abundant supply by, 
it's going to be a relative term. Some people are going to seem to be rich while other people would look at them and have a different measure and would say they're not rich. It's a relative term. But the disciples seem to be of the opinion that everybody that can be saved should be rich. And Jesus looking upon them said, with men it is impossible. This is in response to their question, who then can be saved? Jesus said, with men it's impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Now turn back with me to to, uh, Matthew chapter 6. With that in mind, let's start over in verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust is corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We know how that comes now. We know how to lay up treasures in heaven. It comes by giving. Not hoarding, not trying to keep everything for yourself. But to be generous toward others and give. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? What's he talking about? He's talking about being single-minded toward the handling of resources and money. No man can serve two masters, for either will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon is just a term that um, uh, stands for resources, financial resources. Do you remember when uh, Jesus taught the uh, parable of the sower sowing the word in Mark chapter 4? You remember some of the things that caused the, the, uh, there's four types of ground. Several of the ground was unfruitful. Two of it was completely unfruitful. One brought forth some, but then one was considered to be good ground. Do you remember some of the things that caused the unfruitful ground to be unfruitful? The stony ground that he talked about was affected by the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world. Now, folks, you know as well as I do that Jesus was concerned about things. You know as well as I do that Jesus made plans. But that doesn't mean that he worried. See, Jesus, the Bible tells us that when the Jews took up um, the mandate to kill him, then he walked no more where the Jews were. He made a plan. He was concerned about the cares of One of the cares of this life when he multiplied the loaves and the fishes to feed the 5,000. He was concerned about the people because they had come three days without food or water. So he had concerns. He had cares. This life is going to have cares. Things that we have to attend to. Things that we have to focus on. Things we have to plan for. But the Bible is talking about the comparison of the place that those cares have with the word of God. See, if we start caring about money more than we care about God, that's the problem. And that seems to be the issue with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler is obeying all the commandments of God and the blessing of Abraham is upon him as a result, as it would be on any child of Abraham. But somewhere along the way, the accumulation of wealth took an unhealthy spot in the man's life. And that's the one thing Jesus said that was wrong. The one thing. He needs to get his heart back on the things of God rather than material possessions. Let's keep reading in Matthew 6. Since he's talking about giving, he's talking about relationship with money. Verse 25, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. 
They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. He's talking about priority. He's talking about the kingdom of God, the plan of God, the word of God being first and foremost in your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now all of this goes back to what Jesus talked about where we began in verse 19. It all goes back to not laying up for yourself treasures on the earth, but have treasures in heaven. And we see from the story of the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10 that there's a very fine line that, is, that you have to walk and negotiate between having riches, having the blessing of Abraham come to reality in your life, and letting it take over first place in your life. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Well, it doesn't say prosperity is going to destroy everybody. It says the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Now, the rich young ruler seems to be on that track. If he doesn't change things, and church history tells us um, that the rich young ruler did turn things around and became an important person in the early days of the church as a leader of one of the churches. Whether that's true or not, I like to think that it is, but who knows. But this guy is operating, this rich young ruler is operating in a dangerous way. Because the blessings of God have come to him, but now he's misusing those blessings, or he's attached and important to those blessings that's inconsistent with what we need to have with God. So when Jesus is talking in Matthew chapter 6 about taking no thought for the morrow, he doesn't mean be clueless about your life. He doesn't mean not have a plan. He doesn't mean don't take care of the things that need to be taken care of. He's really saying don't be afraid to give because God will take care of you. He's really saying don't withhold resources that God speaks to you or puts on your heart to use because God will take care of you. Money was such an issue for me. It was such a hard thing for me. I, uh, in about 1975, 6, somewhere around there, well, it was the spring of 76, I had been listening to some tapes that I got. I, I, I really don't know where I got them, but I had a tape series by Brother Hagen called Mountain Moving Faith. And I listened to that. That's the first thing I heard. Well, no, that's not exactly right. I heard another minister teaching what we know as the faith message. And I heard him mention on that. I only heard one tape. And I heard him mention on there about Brother Hagen. And whatever he said made me understand that he got the, the knowledge that he was teaching from Brother Hagen. So I thought, well, okay, let's go to the source. And somehow or another, I know I didn't buy them, I didn't have any money to buy them, but somehow or another, I came upon this hate series, Mountain Moving Faith series by Brother Hagin. And I wore those things out. I don't know if you remember, but uh, cassette tapes would sometimes get spooled up around the, one of the inner workings of the cassette player. If you didn't have a real good quality one or if the tapes were old or whatever, they could spin up and then you've got tape coming out of the cassette and that type of thing. I prayed and put those things back together hundreds of times. I couldn't afford to lose them. I listened to them over and over and over and over and over. Well, most of what Brother Hagin talked about on the, regarding the subject of faith had to do with his own testimony of healing. And you well understand that. That's where he learned the principles of faith. And so I didn't have any real need for healing. But I was trying to appropriate those things and, and um, point them 
toward my need, which was finances. Folks, I started off with nothing. I mean nothing. I don't know if you remember this or not, but back in around 1975 or 6, gas was only 59 cents a gallon. And I didn't have anything to put even a penny's worth in. Gas prices went up a year or so later with the shortages. You remember the gas stations had lines around the block. Looked like Costco, only there was no gas. And you could only buy gas for your car depending on the, uh, the odd or even day of your license plate. You remember that? Any of you remember that? Well, there were some real difficult times for the country. Everybody was un, uh, uh, under a, a big load because of the shortages and the different things that were going on. But I can't tell you how many times I prayed that the gas in my car would make it there and back. I'm looking at that needle, that gas needle, the gas gauge, just praying all along the way that I'd have enough to get wherever I was going. I didn't go anywhere because I wanted to. I only went where I had to unless I was catching a ride with somebody else. Because I just didn't have a penny. I remember one of the first times that I ever was able to give currency paper money in an offering. And I considered that a big step forward because up to the end, I'd just been given change. That's all I had. And there were things that I saw in the word or heard Brother Hagin say, really, didn't see it myself, I just heard him say, that put me on a track to believe God. But trusting him with money was the hardest thing in the world for me. Now, I was determined to do it I wasn't going to let anything hold me back from what I saw and what the Bible says to do. Which is kind of interesting because this passage of Scripture is where Brother Hagin got hung up on his healing. When he became bedfast just before his uh, 16th birthday. Over the course of time, he thought he was in good stead with God and found out that he wasn't even saved. So he had a couple of supernatural experiences and wound up giving his heart to Jesus. But he said that he decided after he got saved that he would read the Bible. He knew one of the parts was the Old Covenant or Old, Old Testament and the other part was the New Testament. He figured that the New took the place of the Old. So he started in Matthew and he got to Matthew chapter 6 where it said, take no thought for your life. Now, he said that he made a commitment to the Lord that in reading the Word, in reading the Bible, he would do everything that he saw that the Bible told him to do. But he got to chapter 6, and he couldn't do it. He didn't make any kind of declaration about it. He just kept on going, reading further and further. And he said, everything after Matthew 6 was darkness to me. He didn't realize it until later. But what he discovered is a good principle for all of us to keep in mind, and that is only the word that you put in practice in your life is light. The Bible says the entrance of of God's word gives light or brings light. That means that which we act on, that which we see and hear in the word and put in practice in our lives. That's what lights us up. That's what lights our path. That's what brings us into the blessings of God. Remember, James talked about being a doer of the word and not hearer only. Well, what's a hearer of the word? He's somebody that doesn't keep it in his focus or his attention long enough to do it. He said that person, the hearer and not the doer, is self-deceived. So Brother Hagin got to the place. After a couple of weeks, he realized that something had changed. And he knew what it was. Instantly, he knew what it was on the inside of him. And so he had to go back to Matthew chapter 6. And commit himself to those scriptures. What did he have to do? He had to cast his care over on the Lord. He had to do the same thing that you and I have to do. If we're going to submit ourselves to the word. We're going to have to cast our cares and our worries and our anxieties. Our fears. We're going to have to cast those over on him. And the funny thing about cares and anxieties. Is that there's only one handle on them. What I mean by that is if you're going to carry them, God can't. And if you're going to turn them over to God, then you can't. 
It's a single-sized handle. Somebody's going to have to carry them, either, either you or the Lord. Well, that's what Peter's trying to tell the church by the Holy Ghost to do. Let the Lord be the one to carry them. Let the Lord be the one to carry them. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. See, real trust, real faith in God means that you accept that God will do what he said he'll do in his word. And so you go on and live your life carefree, worry-free, anxiety-free because you trust him. Because you trust him. One of F.F. F. Bosworth's great healing minister, hundreds of thousands of people were healed in his services. He had pretty much retired from the ministry in 1947 when the healing revival began. And one of the largest um, crowd drawers, one of the most famous of those uh, healing ministers that was used was William Branham. Well, Brother Branham was more of a teacher, not a preacher. I'm sorry, I've got that backwards. He was more of a preacher and not a teacher. Brother Bosworth was a teacher. And so he was convinced, and, and the two men worked it out, and the people that were surrounding Brother Branham were the ones who suggested it, that Brother Bosworth come be a part of the crusades and the meetings, of the rallies that Brother Branham would hold. He could teach on faith and healing in the daytime, and then Brother Branham would conduct the main services at night. And it worked marvelously. There were thousands, probably tens of thousands of healing reports and testimonies that came out as a result of the teaching of the Word. And then Brother Branham would operate by the Word of Knowledge and with gifts of healings at night. And so it would change whole cities. Churches and places that they would go after the meeting was over, the week after the meeting was over, would have to have crutches and wheelchairs and all this kind of stuff carried away by the hundreds. There's some pictures of certain churches where everybody that got healed left their crutches, their braces, their wheelchairs and that kind of stuff. And they just piled them up and made mountains out of these things. One of the most phenomenal moves of God ever seen. Well, Brother Bosworth, his favorite scripture on faith was in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. We which have believed do enter into rest. We which have believed do enter into rest. See, folks, somewhere along the way, you're going to have to decide whether or not you really trust God to take care of what you've asked him for. You're going to have to decide whether you really trust him to do what his word said that he would do. And at the point, and only at that point where you decide that, yes, you do indeed trust him, that's the point where we become carefree. Because if he really is going to do it like we believe, if he really is going to honor his word like we believe that he does and will, then that means we're going to have to let go. But you have to learn to let go. I wish it came naturally to us, but it sure didn't me. Did it you? We have to learn to turn loose of our cares. We have to learn to roll them over on him. We have to learn to do that. Well, how do you learn to do that? By doing that. We learn to trust God by trusting God. We learn to be carefree by being carefree. Well, as I said, healing wasn't an issue for me, but boy, finances had me big time or the lack thereof. I just didn't have anything. I got toward the end of my college years, realized I didn't like the direction that I was headed, didn't want to keep going to school to get a law degree, so I got to the end of my college years, and I didn't know what I was going to do, had no direction, didn't know what I wanted to do. I was just kind of stuck. And so I took a job making commission. The problem is I didn't make any commissions. I didn't have a base salary. I was dependent on my skill doing a job I didn't really want to have. You're not going to make many commissions doing something that you're not convinced or sold out to do. And I wasn't. So I went for a long time without any money whatsoever. I'd do some odd jobs and work construction. I was familiar with some of that because of my dad's position in the um, 
construction, house building business and so forth. So I'd do some odd jobs and earn money along the way as I could. But I was just clueless. I didn't know what God wanted me to do. This is long before I found out anything about Rhema and took a trip out there and, and had the Lord speak to my heart. So I just didn't know what to do. Aimless, wandering around, bouncing from place to place and didn't have enough money to get me there and back. And so when I started seeing in the Word that we're supposed to cast our cares over on the Lord, I was willing to do it. But man, it was tough. It was a struggle. I had a minor financial miracle. Well, it was major for me, but really didn't turn out to be a whole lot of money. But it got me to the place where I could go to Bible school. The problem is, once I got there, how am I going to pay for the bills? Well, I wound up getting two jobs. I worked one job as a janitor in a high-rise office building, worked for a cleaning company, and that was one of the uh, accounts that they had. So I was working 11 to 7 every night, getting home at 7, 15, 7, 30, somewhere around there, going to school at 8, going to healing school in the afternoon, and in, in the early evenings trying to referee basketball and baseball and football and flag football and everything else that I could. And our first year, of, uh, my first year of being in Rama, they had monsoons like you would not believe. Well, what that meant was I didn't have any refereeing games. The football season was pretty well canceled. And if I, I worked consistently, the money was pretty good. It was legitimate. It was decent. But it rained and rained and rained and rained. Bottom line is I had wound up having nothing but the minimum wage job, 11 to 7, working as a janitor in this high-rise office building. Well, it didn't provide enough money to pay, the, to pay the bills. I couldn't pay for school and pay for rent too. And I missed the first month's tuition payment. They had it set up so that uh, about seven months, they broke it down into about seven different payments during the nine-month school year. And I missed the first one. And so in class, the next day, the day after it was due, they called a uh, list of people. There were about eight of us and wanted us to meet with the dean of the school after class. So all eight of us were there and we realized that we were the ones that missed the tuition payment. And so the dean of the school said, we're believing God with you, but we expect your faith to work. So here's what we're going to have to do. This was about on a Wednesday maybe a Thursday. He said, by Monday, you owe the tuition payment that you missed. And because we found that people that are late the first time are usually the ones that are late every time, you not only have to have the first months, which was a couple hundred dollars, you've got to have the whole year's worth of tuition, which was about $1,200. Well, I didn't know $1,200 existed in the world. I'd certainly never seen it. And so, it just so happened that we were coming up on a, a seminar. And this seminar was one that would change the school schedule somewhat because it was primarily for the students. So rather than being in our classes and having a normal schedule, we'd just be responsible for coming to the seminar morning sessions. And then, of course, the, the evening ones, they couldn't require us to go to those because some people had jobs that they had to attend to. And so I was had been instructed from the Lord since the day I got to school that I was supposed to, teach, supposed to treat healing school just like class. Now, healing school was usually taught by Brother Hagen, and I, I really think that's what the Lord had in mind um, just for me to soak up, soak up as much from him as I could. So I'm going to healing school in the afternoons, the morning seminar, healing school in the afternoons, and I can go to the night meeting because it was always out by the time I had to be at work. And um, 
prayer school was something else that I was instructed of the Lord. They'd have a, an hour prayer school before healing school started. And whoever was running healing school, or I'm sorry, prayer school in that, uh, during that week, they had the suggestion that we should all just pray for our own needs. Well, I had come to the place prior to going to that uh, seminar and that class. I'd come to the place where I had just talked to the Lord about it. I didn't pray right away. I didn't pray the day that uh, uh, they told us about things. I prayed the next morning. And I told the Lord in the shower, I've always talked to God in the shower. What else is there to do? So I always talk to God in the shower. And so in the shower the next morning, I told the Lord that I knew that he hadn't done what he had done to get me out there to not go to school. Like I said, it was a miracle for me, not a whole lot of money, but it was the first financial miracle I ever had that got me out there to begin with. And so I told the Lord that I knew that he sent me out there to go to school. So I said this, I told him this, I said, I'm going to pray about this one time. Now I'm, I'm convinced that some of it was me trying to act on the truth of the word that I had heard thus far. But looking back at it, some of it was just the leading of the Lord too, the prompting of God in my heart. Didn't know that at the time. So I told him, I said, now Lord, I'm going to pray about this one time. And I'm not going to give it another thought. I ask you, for the amount of money, the $1,200, whatever it was that I owed. I don't remember what the total amount was now, but it's somewhere in that range. I claim $1,200 by Monday morning. That was our deadline. In the name of Jesus. And I, it was just about that much feeling. I wasn't inspired to pray. I certainly wasn't glad about having to pray. Wasn't thrilled about the need that I had or anything like that so I just said okay so that's it and immediately I began to praise him for the answer and as I did this thought came to me I remember it just as clear as a bell it was like it was yesterday some of the details about the experience are not very clear in my memory but other things I remember exactly and this is one that I remember there was a voice that spoke to my mind and said, you better pray in tongues about this. And I started to, and I caught myself and I said, wait a minute. If I really believe that God heard and answered my prayer, what's there to pray in tongues about? I refuse to pray in tongues over this because for me, it would have been a sign of unbelief. It would have been in response to the voice or the impression that I had. And again, it was in my mind. It wasn't in my heart. But the thought was, praying in tongues is the only way you can make this work. Well, if that's true, then what I'm being taught about faith in God's word isn't right. And I don't need to be in that school anyway, if that's the case. So I just made a commitment. I just said, that's it. I'm not going to pray about it. I'm not going to touch it in thought life. When I remember it, I'll thank you for the answer, Lord. But I'm not going to pray about this one lick. And for the next several days, it was so, so difficult for me. That it seemed like there were supernatural situations like with prayer school I was telling you about the leader of prayer school every day up until the deadline she had people pray for their own needs well that's the last thing in the world I need to do I can rejoice over God hearing and answering my prayer but I do not need to spend time praying in tongues about myself well somehow or another I made it through I'd catch myself my mind slipping over to, the, to my own situation and I'd stop every time saying, nope, 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 nope. I'm going to pray in tongues, but Lord, you know as well as I do, I'm not praying in tongues about myself. Well, supernaturally, the money showed up on Monday morning. It showed up in the mail. It was sent Saturday morning from Birmingham, Alabama. And it arrived Monday morning in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, I don't know what you think about the operation of the mail system. It wasn't special delivery. It wasn't FedEx. There's no way for it to do what it did. Just absolutely no way. But God provided the income. He provided the money that I needed to get back in school and pay off the year. Well, that 
as you can well imagine, that sent me on cloud nine, not just because I had the money, not just because I was out from under the pressure. I still had rent to make. I still had the other things to, to keep up with. The rain kept pouring, so I didn't wind up with any more money in hand than I would have had otherwise. But I recognize God's faithfulness. I recognize his faithfulness. And every issue that I've had, church finances, believing God for money for the church, believing God for the money for this building, all of those things, for me it goes back to that one first experience that I had where God miraculously got the money to me on time. Now, the numbers have changed over the years. Oh, that I would only have to believe for $1,200 for the things concerning the church and the other issues. Looking back, I felt like I, my head was in the guillotine and the, the, the blade was just hovering above my neck ready to take my head off. I look back now, instead of a blade, it was a butter knife. But it seemed just as big. It seemed to me at the time just as big. Now, I found out over the years, as the money, uh, as the numbers have increased, the need getting more and more and more, not only for personal lives, but for the church is concerned. I've found that the devil always tries to tell me that this is different from the other situation, but it's not. It may be bigger. It may be a bigger number, like I have said, but faith works the same in every area. Faith works the same in every area because God's word is just as true in one area as it is in another. And he's just as faithful to honor his word and do what he said in one area as he is in another. So I look back at the things, the bigger numbers and the bigger miracles where the money came in and God provided the need and those types of things. I look back at those and realize that the greater test was to resist the devil's idea and the devil's notion that somehow or another it's not like what he did the first time. I've even had the devil say, well, yeah, that was a great miracle the first time, but this is not the same thing. And it always is. It always is. Look with me over to Philippians chapter 4. Verse 6, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he says, Be careful for nothing. Other translations say, Don't be anxious or fret or have any anxiety about anything. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, we all want that, don't we? We all want the peace of God. And the thing that causes us to be aware of the concerns and the anxieties and the worries is the absence of peace. See, if we'll cast our cares over on him, if we'll roll all of our cares and all of our anxieties over on him, then the peace of God will hold us, will keep us steady. But notice verse 8. Verse 6 was be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7 is in the peace of God, the peace of God, thank God for his peace, which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever th things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. In other words, he's saying, if you're going to have the peace of God as identified in verse 7, you're going to have to, to think the right things that are identified in verse 8. See, the peace of God just doesn't come on its own. The peace of God is the result of us thinking right. Again, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Well, that would mean thinking the right things then, wouldn't it? Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Notice how that scripture, that verse of scripture, identifies trusting God. 
We're trusting God when we keep our minds in the right thing. We're trusting God when we keep our minds on things that are true and lovely and just and pure and honest and good report. Things that have virtue and things that have praise. Well, I don't know much of anything else besides the Word of God that fits all that criteria. There are some things that are true but aren't lovely. There are some things that are true but aren't of good report. But the Word fits all those categories. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. We're going to have to think right, folks. We're going to have to think in line with what the Bible says. We're going to have to learn to practice casting our cares over on the Lord. Because as, it's, as I said, the devil will always be there. He's always ready to tell you that this is different from any other victory you've experienced. This situation is not the same fight you fought before that and found God faithful. But what's different? God's not any different. His word's not any different. If you're different, it should be that you're stronger in faith because you've added experience and you have experienced victory from when you believed him before. So what's changed? Well, the size of the battle might change. But no matter what the battle is, it's always won the same way. And that's by standing in faith on God's word. And lovely. And things that are of good report. Spiritual forces work. The mind is the devil's turf. And you're going to have to meet the devil on his territory. To win the victories of faith. Now some people have a hard time. Saying that there's something that they can see that they're not. Some people have a hard time saying my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. By Christ Jesus, some people have a hard time believing that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, meaning that he paid the price for poverty just like he paid the price for sickness and sin. Some people have a hard time with that because the devil will always tell you, if you're speaking something contrary or that contradicts your physical circumstances, the devil will always tell you you're lying. But folks, you can't lie if you're saying what God said. Paul said it this way to the Romans. He said, let God be true and every man a liar. That means whatever the Bible says about you, if it says you're healed, then the truth is you're healed. That can't be a lie because God said it. And God cannot lie. Because God's words always come to pass, whatever he says would come to pass and will come to pass. If God was able to lie, the lie would be turned into the truth. Because his words always make things work. His word always comes to pass. So you can't ever be lying if you're saying what God says. It's impossible from a spiritual standpoint to lie by quoting the Word of God. So if the Word of God says you're healed, you're healed. With sickness attached to your body, you're still healed. If the Word says that God has made you rich, then God has made you rich. It doesn't matter what your bank account says. It doesn't matter how many bills you got stacked on the table. It doesn't matter how far in debt you may be. The Bible says that Jesus was made poor for your sakes that you through his poverty might be made rich. The truth is you've been made rich. Yeah, but that goes against everything that we can see. Thank God for that. Because some of what we can see doesn't look too pretty. But God's word's always true. The battle may be bigger, but the means of victory is always the same. And that is trusting in God's word. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your faithfulness. Even as you said, Lord, faithful is he who called us, who will also bring it to pass. We thank you, Father, that Jesus was made poor for our sakes. Just like he was made sin for our sakes, that we might have eternal life. Just like he was made sickness, that through his sickness we were healed. In the same way he was made poor, so that we might be made rich. So we say that we are full of the life of God. We say we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. We say we're healed by the stripes of Jesus. We say, Father, that we've been made rich by Jesus' sacrifice. The chastisement of our poverty was upon him 
And so now we've been made rich in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, that you always come through. You always watch over your word to perform it. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never fail. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us.